All right, so today we're going to be discussing what is my identity. And, you know, there's been so many sermons on, on that right there because we are different once we're born again in Christ. Amen? And so we struggle with identities. And so today we're going to unpack the, every aspect of that and, uh, and keep keep it fresh on our minds because because after camp you know we we really honed in on this but after camp it seems like all that big hype and that excitement and everything you get back home and boom there's those temptations again god i thought you took them from me you know i i knelt down at your altar and i and i left them down there how come they're still here well satan never sleeps so so, what shapes who we are? You know, I'm, I'm looking back on my life and its earliest memories. Um, I have some crazy early memories. And, um, you know, I talk to other people and, the, you know, they're, they're junior high before they have good memories. And, and I, I remember taking baths in my grandma's sink. I mean, that's, I hope I was really young. <laughs> I hope I wasn't in junior high then. <laughs> but what shapes us is the earliest memories that we've got, the family, the friends, and our personality. God made us all different. Thank, thank you, God, that you made us all different. And the world probably doesn't need two of me. So we've got to ask us some questions here. Um, just like I'm sure all our kids were asking whenever they got back from camp, um, when those temptations rose their, their ugly heads, why do I think or feel this way? Why do I always end up doing wrong? Why would somebody love me? Has anybody ever had those thoughts? I hope it's not just me. You don't have to raise your hands because I don't want y'all to feel vulnerable this morning. That's, that's for me this morning. So we have to ask ourselves these, these things. And uh, every single person has been plagued with these questions at one point in their life or not. And it's because spiritual warfare, it's real. And if you don't think it's real, we're going to have to open this up and, and dig into it a little bit more. Because spiritual warfare is real and everyday happening. And Satan is real. And the war between good and evil is definitely real. I was chiropractor in horses down at a, at a cutting horse place uh, down in Burnett this week. And, and a good friend of mine that's a trainer there, he was talking about, um, he likes to read about Indians. And uh, he said, you know, there's, there's an old Indian parable that, that says uh, inside of each, each person is, is two wolves. Two wolves. One is a good wolf, one's a bad wolf. And they say, well, well, what makes you good or bad? Well, which wolf do you feed? And so we can take that back as, as Christians. We know that we don't have wolves in us. But we have what this is, flesh. And that flesh, we're born into flesh. We, sin comes naturally because Satan runs all over the place on this earth for a short time. And so through that flesh, that's why we get those thoughts. How come I'm always going back, always going back to those same things, those same addictions? Well, it's because the war between good and evil is real, and it's right here. He's been doing it. Satan has been doing this for a long time, guys, and he is good at it. So the weapons that, that Satan uses is fear, confusion, and he loves hate because hate divides. And as we can look across our nation right now, it is, it is divided. Even homes, if we get real with ourselves, he is snuck in and divided. So those are some of just a few of Satan's weapons that, that likes to get in and confuse us on, on who we really are. 
You know, we have, we have our real hurts. Everybody has their own story. And you know, my testimony is, is a lot different than Russ's. Uh, my testimony is a lot different than Guy Burns's. Um, you know, I thank God that my testimony isn't really, really dark. But every person has that dark spot in their life that maybe they've never told a person due to rejection or due to harsh words or due to some kind of abuse, whether there's many kinds of abuse, but or due to addictions. You know, I, I have something that I've only told a counselor before, and it took me 41 years before I ever told anyone. And to let those words come out of my mouth from, from some of my earliest memories. And I had a great childhood. But every great childhood has a scar here and a scar there. And you know, when God finally showed me that He can take those scars, you may still be able to see it, but you don't have to feel it. Because nine times out of ten, those scars were made by somebody that was only doing the best that they knew how to do. And so you don't have to hold on to that hate and that, that unforgiveness because I know the ones from my childhood, they were doing the best that they could with what they had. Those don't have to hold us back and they do not have to be our identity. So what is my identity? I guess... I'm going to tell you all a little bit. This is off the, I'm, I'm veering off course here. So, I'm going to tell you all a little bit about my identity crisis through growing up. And, you know, I, at first I got to thinking this, and it never hit me until last night when I was having to redo my sermon. And so, I th I'm thinking, well, I've always been Bodie. What you see is what you get. And, I mean, I can't put on an act. I'm not a good actor. Um, but I feel like there for a second I thought, well, I've never changed. Well, we dug into it a little bit last night. And I'm going to show you all three different identity changes in myself. And so first, I was the youngest of four in the family. And it's only because my parents were perfectionists. It took them four tries to get me. And that's true. And none of my siblings are here to, to uh, argue. But, no, I was the youngest of four, and we were just a ranching family. I grew up between Blanket and Zephyr on the family ranch, and I was the fifth generation that grew up in, in that house. And um, anyway, it's really great to grow up on the same place where my granddad and his brother played. We found some of their old toys and get to play around the stump where they burned the place down twice. And uh, I didn't fall far from the tree. But so there I am, born into a ranching family, and I didn't get asked, so what, what are you into? What would you like to do? Well, oldest sister rodeoed. My brother, he was riding calves and steers. My sister, she ran. My other sister was running barrels. So I got told I'm a roughie. Uh, you're riding calves. We're already there. You might as well jump in. And so at four, I am a calf rider. And I, th I think I'm pretty bad at it. And uh, even though my sister would beat me all the time. And um, so my family, with who I was around, brought me into the cowboy way of life and into the rodeo world. That's not a decision I made, but that's who I was around. That's who was pouring into me, and that was my identity. And from the time I was old enough to rig up my own buck and barrel out in the, out in the live oaks, um, I was going to be a world champion bull rider, and I just knew it in my head. I didn't realize one of my good buddies was going to do that four times, and it wasn't me. But, you know, that, that formed a, a great family atmosphere, because it was a lot of good time with my family. 
And so that took on a whole new, you just, I was rooted in rodeo, but I always remember loving the Lord. And my parents had a great foundation built for us. And at a young age, I was probably 15, completely obsessed with bull riding by then. And um, I went to a church, and this lady called me out of the, out of the crowd, scared me to death. I, sh- I thought she was crazy. But she told me, she said, uh, you're going to help lead thousands to Christ with your gift of music. Well, I didn't know this lady, and it really creeped me out. Well, my mom nurtured that and it scared me so I ran the other way they tried to force me to play the guitar and I was like no I'm a bull rider and so eight years after high school I finally come to the end of that identity I finally decide it's time for a family and and I believe we were pregnant with with Malachi uh, when I got on my last bull and and it took God protecting me on that last one um, he he stepped on my head and laid down on me it took three guys to get him off and uh, he just he was mauling me and um, you know when you get I don't know if you've been knocked out before but every time I get knocked out I would hear a vroom. that's what I'd hear well I heard that whenever he stepped on my head and woke me up and so I think God was like, okay, I'm, I'm done with protecting you. You know, this is enough. And so it finally hit me. That chapter of my life is over. Well, guess what? Satan had a field day with me. I never drank while I was rodeoing because I was so obsessed. I would only seek God on the Sundays as I was home. And oh yeah, I would pray in front of everybody and I, I, was, I was out in the open about my faith, but I did not seek God. And so Satan comes in, he's like, you don't even know who you are now. You, you're a failure. You were not good enough. Now, what are you going to do? And so we're in Waco by this time and I'm very unstable. And we end up back in Gulfweight. I did not pray about it. Lisa and I did not pray about coming back to Gulfweight. But, as all y'all know, our God can make a bad decision and turn it for good. Thank you, Jesus, for that. So as I'm going through my identity crisis, I get to Gulfweight, and I don't really know how to make, make ends meet, so... I decided I'm going to break and train horses. So Bodie hit the ground a whole lot. But I learned a lot of things. And next thing you know, I, I get in with, with some guys day working and, and working cattle. And, uh, and so two of, my, two of my best friends are sitting out here today, Brian Brookings and Marshall Winters. And uh, that's the time in my life where I met those two guys. And it was like, oh, my gosh, these are like brothers from another mother. And anyway, we had so much fun, but at the same time, I, I, it's not a big change in identity, but I went to just straight up cowboy then. And I, I was telling myself, I'm punchy. And so I fall in, and next thing you know, Bodie is drinking beer. I didn't even like beer. Next thing you know, and just like I tell the youth, it starts small. It starts really small. Next thing you know, I was popping a top at 6.30 on the way to the cow working. And I didn't even realize that it had started that way. And so there's a battle, good and evil, just pulling on me. And I was like, I never would have dreamed I would have gotten addicted to alcohol having an alcoholic father, and it ruined my brother's life. And I just never would have imagined that. And all of a sudden, that identity is hanging over my head. You're an alcoholic. You're a horrible father. You're this. You're that. It's that spiritual warfare. 
And then here comes the third identity. I finally have to get a, a job in town. And I go to the telephone co-op here. And God opens that door and just kicks me through it. And he says, get in there, son. And I love, I love my job. I've loved every job I've ever had. Well, except for I'm not telling you all that job. <laughs> but I love the job there. But it felt like my identity was gone again. I'm like, well, now I've got a cush job sitting, sitting at a desk in the air conditioning. And my pants don't fit anymore for some reason. And so there goes Satan. He's just picking. And, and whenever he does that, I don't know if y'all have noticed, but his voice sounds exactly like your own voice. That's why you believe it. I mean, he's that sneaky. And, you know, I wish he would have used like the King of the Hill voice. I'm like, oh, here, Bodie, uh, you're worthless. I've always wanted to use that voice in front of y'all. <laughs> but no, Satan really does. He just hones in and just, it feels like you're being defeated. And then God called me here. And when I, when I gave my, my life to the ministry, that identity I mean, it was like a whirlwind, and for the good, because I found my identity in Christ, and I know who I am, and that's where we're going to start today. And so, I've got an a insert in your bulletin that you can take home with a lot of this information that as you're going through the week to remind yourself, because this is battle, guys. This is real battle. So, I am... In 2 Corinthians 1, 20, 21 and 22 says, Now it is God Himself who has anointed us, and He is consistently strengthening both you and us in union with Christ. He, he knows we are His, since He has also stamped His seal of love under, or over our hearts and has given us the Holy Spirit like an engagement ring is given to a bride and a down payment of blessings to come. I use the Passion Version today. I, I like the Passion Version, and it just, sometimes I like to see the different way this, the, that God's Word is worded. And, uh, but that is so powerful, like the engagement ring. The bride shows it off, and that is a promise of things to come, and that is God's promise to us of an eternal life with Him. We are his masterpiece, no matter what Satan tells us. No matter what Satan's saying about our appearance, about what we've done. In Philippians 1.6, it says, I pray with great faith for you because I'm fully convinced that the one who began this gracious work in you will faithfully continue the process of maturing you until the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ continually maturing you the three phases in my life now I'm finally in that spot in life where I feel like I'm getting started it took like up in like 30 plus years for me to fool around and do my thing and now I'm in the growing season and he gives us a helper we're not alone in 2 Timothy 1 7, he says, For God will never give you the spirit of fear. Amen and amen. We got to grab onto that and, and own that. But the Holy Spirit, who gives you mighty power, love, and self control. You know, you say, Well, you don't know. I've, I've been doing this my entire life. And uh, whenever I try to put this, this certain thing down, I really hate people. You know, something that grabs a hold of you like that is not of God. He gives us self-control. He took alcohol from me as I drove out this gate one day. On a Wednesday night, I was going home to sneak off in my barn 
after the service and drink by myself. I know it's pitiful. But I was. And God said, right as I pass through that gate, be of sober mind because Satan roams around like a roaring lion seeking for whom he may devour. And uh, Malachi is in the, in the passenger seat with me that day too. And he prepared me for the worst night of my life. That's how much my God loves me. And that's how he sent, that's why he sent the Holy Spirit to me with his mighty power and love to give me self-control. By the way, I haven't, I haven't wanted a taste of it since. Hallelujah. Almost two years ago. I'm proud of that. Satan has no authority over me. He has no authority over you. In 1 John, we find in 5.18, we are convinced that everyone fathered by God does not make sinning a way of life because the Son of God protects the child of God and the evil one cannot touch him. I'm convinced as well. You know, it's not our, our spirit that wants to sin. It is our flesh, as we talked earlier about. It's our flesh that wants that so bad. Because Satan's just stirring it up, stirring it up, agitating it. We're righteous. Inside, God makes us righteous. God makes us new. And Satan has no authority, no matter what those whispers say. So never forget, Matthew 5.13, Your lives are like salt among the people. If you, like salt, become bland... How can your saltiness be restored? Flavorless salt is good for nothing and will be thrown out and trampled on by others. I love this because since I was a kid, I've, I've heard, oh man, that's a good, that is one good guy. He's salt of the earth. Never understood that. I just, I liked salt. And so I was thinking, well, he must be good. But, but here's where it comes from. And... I'm thinking to myself, well, how do you, how do you use, lose your saltiness? And I'm thinking, uh, who do you hang around? Who, who are you listening to? What are you pouring into yourself? What are you pouring into your soul? Well, if you load it down with sugar, which I know y'all probably think I'm full of sugar because I'm so sweet. He said, yeah. (laughs) But what are you putting into yourself? That's how you lose the salt. Continuing in Matthew 5, Your lives light up the world, for how can you hide a city that stands on a hilltop? And who would light a lamp and then hide it in an obscure place? Instead, it's placed where everyone in the house can benefit from its light. It's very, very hard to shine your this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine in a bar. It's really hard to do that. Have you all ever tried? Well, I've tried to witness in a bar before, and uh, I realized later how tainted of a, of a witness that was. But I know that, I know that God can still sprout them seeds. But, but it's hard to put it up on a hill. When you're hanging with the pigs. So don't hide your light. Let it shine brightly before others. So that your commendable works will shine as a light upon them. And then they will give their praise to your Father in heaven. That says to me, it's contagious. This smile, I can't wipe it off very often. I know, I know some people have seen it wiped off before. Every once in a while, Russ has to say, Hey, are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm good. Well, tell your face. Well, I can't help but to have this smile quite often. And it's contagious because the love of Christ is bubbling out. So I've got to tell myself every day I am chosen. Another identity. 
So many people just feel like they're just in this world and they're not important. That's wrong. That's Satan talking to you. I am chosen. In John 15, 16, it says, you, did not, you didn't choose me, but I've chosen and commissioned you to go into the world and bear fruit. Russ has just preached on this uh, last week, I believe. And, and your fruit will last because whatever you ask in my Father, of my Father, for my sake, He will give it to you. So, this scripture has been twisted so much throughout time. This is Jesus speaking right here. This is His words. And so, it says, Whatever you ask of my Father for my sake, He will give it to you. I asked a good friend one time, you know, I'm just struggling. I don't, I don't know how to make this right, you know, if this decision is right. And he's like, oh, decisions are easy. Are they glorifying to the Savior? Are they glorifying to the Father? Are they lifting the Father up? If not, it's wrong. Black and white, simple. Just put it in that context because He has chosen us. And he's there to back us up. And we're God's workmanship. You know, we kind of, we are what we have. You know, God makes us different, different shapes, sizes. And, but we're his handiwork. I don't know if you've ever built anything, but you're proud of that when you build it. You know, you, you want to show that off. Well, so is God. He's proud of that. In Ephesians, if you're ever struggling on, on what you think about yourself and your identity, get into Ephesians. It is full of good stuff. So Ephesians 2.10 says, We have become His poetry. Poetry is beautiful. So we're His beautiful poetry. And created people that will fulfill the destiny He has given each, each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the Anointed One. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. Predestined, God stitched us together in our mother's womb. We are not accidents. Every single face in here is not an accident. Every single person in here was born a male or female for His purpose, to fulfill His purpose. We're His handiwork. And when we're okay with changing what God made us, we're trying to play God. And there is a huge consequence of that. You can read Sodom and Gomorrah later if you want. But we're his workmanship. So going further into Ephesians, we also have peace. We don't have to succumb to, to our anxieties. That's just another tool from Satan. Ephesians 2.14 says, Our reconciling peace is Jesus. He has made Jew and non-Jew one in Christ. By dying as our sacrifice, He has broken down every wall of prejudice that separated us and has now made, the, made us equal through our union with Christ, the Anointed One. So through His death, now we have the access to the Father. So if we were worthless and trash, how could we have, how could we have access to the Father? So we have access through Him. We see that in Ephesians 18, 2.18. And now because we are united to Christ, we both have equal and direct access in the realm of the Holy Spirit to come before the Father. Old Testament did not have that. You know, it just it breaks my heart to think about that. But thank God that, we, that He sent a Savior to give us direct access. We're not orphans. 
You know, I know that we've all felt abandonment at one point in time or another. Or you may be a physical orphan in this world. But whenever we are born again to Jesus Christ, we are no longer orphans. So you are not foreigners or guests, but rather you are children of the city of the holy ones with all the rights as family members of the household of God. Adoption process taking place. The old is gone. You have your new father. And that makes us secure. The next verse says, You are rising like a perfectly fitted stones of the temple. Each one of us are blocks in the temple. And your lives have been built up together upon the foundation laid by the apostles and the prophets. And best of all, you are connected to the head cornerstone of the building, the anointed one, Jesus Christ himself. So we are the holy temple. This, this is our temple. Ephesians 2.21 says, In this entire, build, this entire building is under construction and is continually growing under his supervision until it raises up completed as a holy temple of the Lord himself. So until we're at home with the Father in heaven, we are still being built. One of the biggest mistakes of my life was being so critical on someone that was not at the same spot on the track to, to our Father in heaven. You know, our, our walks all look different. I mean, it, if, if our walks were all the same, how boring would that be? And one of the biggest mistakes and the hardest lessons learned was their, their walk doesn't look the same as mine. They're not doing it right. No, they're at a different point and building their temple. It takes each process in God's timing to do it. And we are not God. Amen. So we've got a protected temple. And this is a whole sermon by itself. But protecting the holy temple, you can find it in Ephesians again, 6, 10 through 18. Read it. I know you probably heard it since you were a kid. Um, the armor of God, helmet of salvation, shield of faith, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, feet prepared with the gospel of peace, and the sword of the Spirit. And so, as you take that paper home with you, you're activating the armor of God. It's not just hear it here and go home and throw it away. It's a daily battle. So, I know that's a lot of information, but what's our identity? So have we turned the voices off yet? It's easy to turn it off in here, but it gets loud out there, guys. We're not alone. We're not alone when we leave these walls. Walls can't contain my God. Don't be obsessed with money, but live content with what you have. For you always have God's presence. For hasn't He promised you, I will never leave you, never. And I will not loosen my grip on your life. I love this wording. He's got you in His grasp. Yes, you have free will. But he's got you. He's ready to lift you up whenever you get, get done with, with your identity crisis. He's ready to lift you up. Because I am. We're wrapping this up now. Um, while the band comes up. We're just going to... This is a pep rally. So before we get out into the world... Before we go into the outside, maybe I'll watch cartoons. I love that. We're going into the outside to proclaim who we are. We're blameless. 
And I've wrote, I've wrote scriptures down where you can find all this. But, but we are blameless. We are safe in Christ. We are set free. We can break any chains that Satan's put on us. We can break any vice that he's stuck in our head with his lies. We're more than conquerors. We're overcoming. We're redeemed, born again, delivered, victorious, and loved. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I'm grabbing a hold to that. I'm grabbing a hold that I am redeemed. That house that I lived in is vacant. That house that, that was full of my old addictions. You know, I know that back in my early 20s, whenever I was rodeoing with, with some, some boys, that I never struggled with pornography whenever I was in high school. But as a young adult, bam, we've got the internet now and it's everywhere. It's a real struggle. Did that make me a horrible person? No. That made me a person living in flesh. That was not my heart. And Satan can bring that up all he wants, but that was in that old house, and that old house is vacant and empty and gone. He can throw that back in my face about, about the alcohol. He can throw it in, in my face all, the, all he wants. But I know I'm redeemed. I know I'm delivered. And I know that I'm victorious. And that's something to get excited about. I don't know what you may be going through in your lives today or what, what is going around through your head that you're trying to figure out. Hey, is that, is that real? Is that... My God, don't, don't condemn me. My God gave me a new life, a new home. My God is love. My God don't, don't browbeat me. My God don't say, well, you almost made it, made it in. I saw a Facebook, which I know everything on Facebook is true. And it was, it was a guy standing there talking to, to St. Peter and wanting to get into heaven. And he said, man, you were this close. Except for that day you were working cattle. And we proved it. The grinders over here, they all jumped in. And, and uh, Wyatt, he jumped in and helped us work cattle Friday. And we proved it. You can work cattle without using adjuverbs. It's, it's doable. It's doable. But no, my God has given, given me a new vocabulary. He's given me a new topic to talk about at work around the, around the watering hole. He's given me hope. He's given me a new smile. And He has delivered me from that old man. And that old man is gone. And so, as we close today, if you're ready to, to leave that behind, We'll have people up here that, that can, can pray with you. Or if you're, if you're a little worried about going up in front of somebody, catch me or Russ or the elders uh, afterwards because we can go through this, this trial with you. We can support you. That's what a church is. A lot of people don't like to come into a church because they say, oh, it's just all hypocrites. Yes, we all sin. We all know that. We fall short. But guess what? We're coming here this morning with God on our mind, and it's like a hospital here. We've had a hard week. We've been beaten up by the, by the devil. But we come back here and get filled up. And now, with your paper, we got some ammo. And we're going to go out and proclaim who we are in Christ because we're conquered.